I think we should just jump right on into Tornado Cash because that was a, a recent really big story. And I think that it almost sets a, an interesting precedent that I'd like to talk through with you. So what do you think of, and maybe we should even clarify for anyone who's not fully familiar with the Tornado Cash situation, but uh, it's a... Um, it's a decentralized application that people, it's a crypto mixer. So you can send crypto to Tornado Cash and it mixes it up. And so, and it sends it to an address. So the, it doesn't look like it's coming from you. It's kind of like a way of sending crypto anonymously. Um, so I, ho- I hope that's a good explanation there. But what do you think of this action that the government's taken on Tornado Cash and, and sanctioning its use and saying that we can't use that anymore because it's being used for illicit activity? Yeah. I think I want to like back up for one second on Tornado Cash and just say the key thing for Tornado Cash, and you can see this um, across what the developers have done, like the Tornado Cash developers, in that their real focus was on privacy, right? Their focus was not on being able to help bad actors. I mean, they specifically did things to not help bad actors. They created compliance tools built into it. They even hired what's referred to as a blockchain analytics company. Um, that essentially tracks wallets that are connecting and blocks those that are tied to um, sanctions. Um, So just setting the stage for that, basically what ended up happening is that the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is OFAC, um, that um, administration uh, administers the sanctions regime in the U.S., which is essentially a regime that is intended to protect like U.S. national interests something that is extremely important um, in the U.S. Um, basically, what OFAC decided to do was that it put um, basically a set of Tornado Cash addresses on the sanctions list. Essentially, there's this list, which refers to as a specially designated nationals list. It's a list that has tons of people's names on them. These are people that U.S. people are not allowed to deal with. Um, they also have a ton of assets on there, um, including like ETH wallet addresses. And those ETH wallet addresses are actually tied to specific people on there. And they're basically saying, the U.S. government is saying, you're not allowed to uh, interact with this wallet address whatsoever. And so what they ended up doing with Tornado Cash is they put a bunch of wallet addresses on there. For example, they put a Gitcoin grants address on there. Um, But then they also did something that they've never done before, which is they put a smart contract address, being the core smart contract address for Tornado Cash. Um, essentially what that ended up meaning is that no U.S. person is allowed to interact with that smart contract. So if you have funds as a U.S. person in that smart contract, you have no right to actually withdraw the funds from that smart contract. Now, the intended purpose of this is to basically say, we want to stop North Korea from being able to launder money through Tornado, tornado Cash. But the thing that OFAC did not do at all is think about the collateral impact of that, right? And basically, one of the biggest collateral impacts um, is the fact that now U.S. people who have funds in there literally have no right to take their funds out of it. Um, The problem with this, other than this collateral impact, is that basically what the U.S. government just did is it took a neutral technology, being Tornado Cash, which is just as neutral as the internet and just as neutral as Ethereum. And it basically said, because this has been used roughly 30% of the time for nefarious activity, we are going to put it on the sanctions list. And that's basically where we stand right now. Gotcha. So I, I think that I didn't realize some of the specifics that you had listed out there. Um, is this the first time that they've sanctioned a smart contract address versus sh- someone's personal Ethereum wallet address? Or have we even seen that smart contract um, getting like blacklisted before? Yeah, we've never seen a smart contract um, listed on there before. And honestly, no lawyer you would have spoken to would have ever thought that they would see a smart contract address listed on the SDN list. It was like a very, very surprising result. Yeah. So I'd like to kind of break down here, you know, what what does it mean as a precedent that's being set that this open source code is being criminalized, that the smart contract address is being criminalized? I mean, in in a non-Web3 comparison, I'm almost thinking, is that the equivalent of saying you can't use Venmo because some people Venmo drug dealers or you know something like that? I mean, it, that's what it seems like in my head when I'm, when I'm thinking about the explanation. Yeah, I'd say it's even worse than that. 
I mean, I think your explanation is good in that it is essentially Venmo can be used for good or bad. But the difference with Venmo is that there are actually people behind Venmo um, who can actually decide whether they want to stop a transaction or not stop a transaction, whether they want Venmo to be used for good or whether they want Venmo to be used for bad. This is even worse with Tornado Cash because there is nobody to make those decisions. The tornado, the core Tornado Cash smart contracts admin keys were burnt. There is nothing that anybody can do about those contracts whatsoever. So people are going to continue to launder money through Tornado Cash if they want to launder money through Tornado Cash, even if they, they're on the, the the contracts on the SDN list. And that that uh, the burning of those private keys is important to note because I saw and maybe it was by you, maybe it was by other people commenting on the situation. People were discussing like the, the people can recreate like this. This is open source code. So someone can spin up another smart contract that does the, the, essentially the exact same things as Tornado Cash. But Tornado Cash has been vetted. It's been used. It's something that the Web3 community knows that you can use Tornado Cash without potentially having your funds like stolen from you. And so if someone spins up a copy of Tornado Cash that hasn't proved that they've burned the private keys, you know, you could be now exposing yourself to um, something super risky. So it seems like, A, it's getting rid of a, a tech that's been used and like trusted by the community. And, and then it just brings up this concept of like, what happens when you, you're, you're sanctioning a technology as opposed to an individual or an entity? And I got this like Brian Armstrong quote, CEO of Coinbase. He said, sanctioning a technology as opposed to an individual or entity seems like a bad precedent to me and it should be challenged. Could have many downstream unintended consequences. So what, what could the downstream consequences of this be if, you know, this kind of legal practice was, you know, looked to be used again when it comes to like crypto tech. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few things. There's some things that are like actually direct impacts, right? So if we actually just look at what I mentioned earlier, which is like US people using um, Tornado Cash, they can't. Okay, well, that's the first one. That's the closest impact. Then you get one step removed from that. And you say, what other impacts are there? Okay, well, what we also saw a lot on Twitter was complaints about people getting blocked from using interfaces. Um, and basically, the reason that happened is because a lot of DeFi interfaces, even though the protocols are completely open source and permissionless, the interfaces are hosted in a centralized manner. And so those interfaces, the developers behind them, will essentially use blockchain analytics companies to determine whether they are in their determination, able to transact with a certain address. Well, what ended up happening is because a smart contract that has sent funds to, I've seen up to like 50% of all Ethereum addresses have somehow touched OFAC, like indirectly through wallet hops, that basically you had a ton of people getting blocked from transacting on different um, DeFi platforms as a result of that. That's like a second uh, impact. I think the most important one that Brian was referring to is the precedent that this sets from like a technical perspective, a technological perspective, which is, I, I said earlier, like no lawyer would have thought that you would have a smart contract address put on the SDN list. And the reason for that is because you're basically like limiting free speech in that instance, right? So code is speech. Um, we know that. And when co there are limitations on that for what it's worth, like people talk about the code is speech thing as if it's like a, a ultimate truth. It's not. Um, there is code that if it is written in certain ways, for example, if you write code that is intended, intended to cause AI to go kill people, that code is not going to be protected speech, <laughs> um, like very clearly. Um, but most code um, is protected speech, especially code that is neutral in its activity in the way that Tornado Cash was. And so the problem with this now is that if you're a developer, you're sitting there saying, what is it that I can develop and just write code for? and actually get in legal trouble for. Whereas before you would have asked yourself, okay, if I write this code, I'm probably gonna be fine. What I need to be careful about is what activity I do around that. Am I hosting certain things? Am I marketing it in an incorrect way? And so setting a precedent where essentially you are going to go ahead and prevent American people from using open source code is a very bad precedent. And honestly, if we do nothing about it, it essentially like opens the door for other regulatory agencies 
to essentially try to go after code itself rather than actually the activity of people around that code. I really, really like that explanation and, and talking through uh, how code is viewed from a speech perspective. And then, and you even when we started talking about Tornado Cash in the beginning, had talked about how they've, when it comes to intent, they've done a lot of things to, it seems like, show that Tornado Cash isn't built to be intended to use for those nefarious reasons. I've got like a, a Twitter thread pulled up listing some reasons why Tornado Cash might be used for, you know, the, the average person. Maybe you want to, you've been doxxed and you're being harassed online, so you want to send funds anonymous, anonymously. You want to anonymously gift to a cause. Um, you're being paid in crypto and don't want your employer knowing your financial details. So, you know, hiding personal wallet addresses and stuff like that. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of real use cases for Tornado Cash. Um, and I guess we'll be, we'll be following this, right? This, it seems like there's definitely going to be downstream uh, action probably being taken to maybe reverse this or just make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of infighting in the community over this. And what I really hope, and I know there's some uh, who are who are focused on doing this, um, that there's going to be like the community coming together to really actually fight this against those who who we need to fight. And there's certain organizations, uh, Coin Center, DeFi Education Fund, Blockchain Association, that are like policy and advocacy orgs. They're already coming together to make plans on like what they can do. Um, and I just hope, honestly, the rest of the community can do it because like what we've seen from a um, like regulatory perspective is that when the community comes together and acts as one, we're like extremely powerful in the space. The most evident has been like um, around the infrastructure bill. Um, uh, what is it? A couple uh, a couple years ago, a year ago now, um, where you basically had you know tens of thousands of letters from the crypto community written to policymakers around this bill and phone calls being made. Point is that we have like amazing community and that we just need to like act together as one um, against those who are actually taking bad actions. You're listening to the Unstoppable Podcast the go-to place for everyone to learn about the latest innovations in Web3, NFTs, and the decentralized web. Welcome to the Metaverse.